We're continuing our study of 1 Peter, and like most New Testament letters, uh, Peter begins by laying the theological, philosophical foundation for the purpose of his letter. Now, the theme of 1 Peter, as we've discovered, is holiness. Be holy as I am holy. Oh, would you like your Bible, dear? <laughs> the whole world knows now. Everybody's watching. There you go. Now, yeah. So we've adopted as our theme for 1 Peter the, the phrase or the theme, authentic holiness. And we've talked a little bit about just exactly what holiness is and is not. You know, the idea of being holy, when you think about it, is naturally associated with religion in general and Christianity in particular. I mean, think about, for instance, have you ever heard of an unholy Christian? I mean, that's an oxymoron. There's no such thing as an unholy Christian. There may be some Christians who do some pretty unholy things from time to time, I'm sure. Uh, but uh, an unholy Christian it would be the same thing as uh, hot ice or dry water. And so what I want us to, to begin to see, and we've already talked about this a little bit, is the, the idea that if we're a Christian, well, holiness is just a part of, the, part of the deal. So far, Peter has asserted these two things. Number one is that all who are Christian, all who are followers of Jesus, are called to be holy. That is, holiness is not just for a few special Christians. It's not just for preachers and missionaries and evangelists and church ladies and, and things like that. Uh, holiness is something that, that all Christians are supposed to be. Second, it, Peter asserts that being holy is what we are right now. It's not just something that we will become or something that we will finally be, but we are told in the Scripture, and Peter tells us this in his letter, that we are holy because He who called us is holy. It is a declaration of of God. If you'll take your Bible and open it to 1 Peter chapter 1, we'll review those verses. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 15 and 16 simply says this, but just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. And we mentioned this last week and the week before. Literally what that says is, just as he who called you is holy, so you shall be holy. You also are holy, for it is written, be holy because I am holy. Now next week, Peter is going to begin to get very specific and very practical about what it means to be holy. And so there will be some behaviors and, and characteristics and traits and things that, that we will specifically focus on. Uh, but in today's passage, he completes the theological, philosophical foundation of this concept of holiness. So follow along with me in 1 Peter chapter 1, starting at verse 17. Actually, let's back up here. Starting at verse 17. Since you call on a father who judges each man's work impartially, live your lives as strangers here in reverent fear, for you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and glorified him, and so your faith and hope are in God. Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth, so that you have sincere love for your brothers, love one another deeply from the heart. For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring word of God. For all men are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers, and the flowers fall. But the word of the Lord stands forever. And this is the word that was preached to you. I just read 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 17 to 25. And in this passage, Peter lays out two philosophical assumptions or presuppositions that will then guide the rest of the letter. The first one is this. In verse 17, since you call on a father who judges... And so he says, since you call on a father who judges, all right, all is good. I got the thumbs up. Since you call on a father who judges, therefore, I guess we could insert, be holy. And the second presupposition is this, now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth. And so there's, there's basically, the, that is going to then be the, the foundation for the rest of this letter. Let's look at those one at a time. Verse 17 since you call on a father who judges each man's work impartially. You know, a God who judges is not in vogue in most modern preaching. We don't hear much about the judgment of God. 
It, don't hold your breath waiting for Osteen to write a book on the judgment of God. You know what I mean? Uh, and for that matter, if you go back a generation or so, back when preaching about the judgment of God was popular, at least in recent decades, it was usually directed at them. You know what I mean? We Christians would gather together and preachers would preach about the judgment of God on them and those people and those sinners, of course not us, because we're saved. But I want you to notice that verse 17, 1 Peter chapter 1, this is clearly directed at us. Since we, since you, since we together call on a Father who judges each man's work impartially, that's us. We're supposed to uh, live accordingly. We are mistaken to believe that because we have been saved, and we're grateful for that, but we are mistaken to think that because we've been saved, we've avoided any and all judgment by God. And this is clearly contradicted by 2 Corinthians 5.10, which says, for each of us, again, 2 Corinthians is written to Christians, each of us must stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Now, recognizing that God, who in His infinite love has saved us, yet will still judge us in some capacity. Granted, it's in heaven. It gets really theologically thick here. But knowing that we still must stand before God someday, even though saved, should evoke in us a healthy fear. Notice what it says back in the text. Since you call on a father who's, who judges each man's work impartially, live your lives as strangers here in reverent fear. It's interesting. I want you to know the word reverent is not actually in the text. That's inserted by the translators. Your translation might say it a little bit differently. That's inserted by the translators, I would say, to sort of soften the blow. But something that, that Christians really struggle with is the Bible clearly teaches that we are to fear God. And typically the way that is explained is, well, to fear God means to hold him in, in awesome reverence. And, and it, it doesn't mean to fear like and be afraid. Listen, let me tell you what it means. It means to fear is and be afraid. Now, there's a, there's a mixture of feeling there in that we don't need to be afraid because God has made His promises to us, and we know that He will keep His promise of salvation. He has extended His grace to us. We've received His grace and forgiveness. But we should never forget that we will, in fact, stand before our God who judges each man's work impartially. And there should be an element of fear involved in that. There was an ancient Jewish prayer called the Shimon Esra that began with these words, and now to the great, mighty, and terrible God. Now, when was the last time you thought of God as being terrible? And of course, the word terrible has a, a much fuller meaning than perhaps we use in, in common usage. Uh, but even the, the ancient Jewish people who clearly understood the nature of God, and we read that throughout the Psalms, God is, is a, a God of loving kindness. He's a God who keeps His promises. He is God who strengthens the weak. He's a God who rescues the, uh, the powerless. We know all of the great things about God, but He is also still God, the Almighty One, the Creator of the universe. I came across this in my studies this week. This was an interesting quote. It said, When men demand a God whom they need not fear, they demand an idol that does not exist. Say that again, when men demand a God whom they need not fear, they demand an idol that does not exist. Think of this in our, our common approach to what I call our buddy Jesus. You know what I mean? Jesus is our best friend. Now listen, I, I want you to get this. I don't want you to get all bad news today. You got, if you want bad news, then, then just stop the, the, the live stream and go over to CNN or, or whoever, you know, and you can get bad news. I don't want you to get all bad news today. But what I want, want us to understand is it is true that Jesus is, in fact, the friend that sticks closer than a brother. He is our best friend. That, that is absolutely true. God incarnated, became one of us, walked among us, moved into the neighborhood, and, you know, and, and fellowshiped with us. In fact, Jesus said to his followers, I no longer call you servants, but I call you friends. Good on sound? All right. I no longer call you servants, but I call you friends. It's a Jesus is our best friend. But he's more than just our best friend. He's not our peer. He's not our buddy. He's not just some guy from the neighborhood. He's not just some guy we grew up with. He is 
God in the flesh, creator of the universe, someday the judge of every human being, and our best friend. So there should be a, a certain element of fear involved in that. So Peter asserts that the same God who calls us holy and to be holy will also judge us. But then I want you to review the, the scripture again. He doesn't leave it at that. In, in fact, it flows into this. He says, since you call on the Father who judges each man's work impartially, live your lives as stranger here in reverent fear, for you know. It, had it stopped right there, you'd say, man, that's kind of scary. He says, for you know it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. So Peter asserts that the same God who calls us holy and calls us to be holy, who will also judge us, has gone to great lengths to save us, namely the precious blood of the Lamb. And then Peter's second presupposition, now that you have purified yourselves, basically uh, by obeying the truth, is it, it kind of goes like this. Since we'll all stand before God, but we're all in, you, you obeyed the gospel, you've received Christ, since we will each stand before and someday uh, the God who is holy and righteous judge who also has saved us at an infinitely incalculable cost, namely the precious blood of Christ, since we are in Christ, we are to be holy. And next week, like I said, it, it gets a little more specific. So today, I'm looking for the clock. I moved it over here. <laughs> so, I have no idea how much time we have because we started at a weird time. So I'm just going to keep going, and hopefully you're still out there. <sighs> you guys here are trapped. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, holiness, we're going to talk about today, holiness in general. In today's message, you'll be happy to know, has only two points, and now we're up to them. And that is there are two general characteristics of what it means to be holy. And the first one is simply this, we are to live differently. This is Charles Spurgeon who said this. Listen to this. This is a great, great metaphor, great illustration. Christians should live in the world but not be filled with it. A ship lives in the water, but if the water gets into the ship, she goes to the bottom. So Christians may live in the world, but if the world gets into them, they sink. Back to verse 17. Live your lives as strangers. There, there's a, an interesting group of, of words that are used there. The King James Version talks uh, uses the phrase as sojourners. You know what a sojourner is? It's somebody who's just a passing through, somebody who, who's journeying through. The New American Standard says living as in exile. This sort of sort of came to me. I was thinking that the this harkens back to the Old Testament when the Jews lived in Egypt. They understood that they weren't Egyptians. They knew that their home was somewhere else. They, they knew that quite literally. Listen, we are living in Egypt. You know what I'm saying? We live in Egypt. This is not our home. The New Living Translation puts it this way. It says temporary residence. It says temporary residence. The Greek word there is parochias, parochias which means literally living next to. It's like the phrase Jesus used, in but not of the world. I want to look at a few different passages of Scripture. Uh, Philippians chapter 3, verse 20, says this, our citizenship. Now, let me pause there for a second. Dr. Brown, who I've always known as Mike, <laughs> Mike shared with us earlier, and uh, I, I don't know if you were able to hear the interview or not. If you weren't, if we didn't have the sound fixed by then, please comment, and we'll do it again next week if we have to, okay, because it was really important information. Um, basically, for those of you who missed it, let me just sum it up for you. Mike says, burn everything and, and live in the woods. I'm kidding. It didn't say anything like that at all. <laughs> so, but, uh, but Mike did say that, you know, as these social distancing and, and other restrictions either enforced or not. By the way, we've noticed cops driving through the church parking lots in the neighborhood. Because they, they did say starting at midnight, you know, last night, uh, they were going to enforce the, the no assembly rule. So we've given Gunner the instructions of what to say if the cops come in. Basically that this is only the necessary people. 
uh, to make this happen online. But Mike had mentioned in his comments how we as Americans, you know, we don't, we don't like people telling us what to do. We, <laughs> we as human beings, but especially as Americans, we don't like people telling us what to do. We don't like people telling us what not to do. And so while most of us, once the panic or the fear of getting this disease has worn off, it will probably give way to a, a irritation and maybe a little anger yeah, as we get tired of, of, of doing what we've been, been told to do. Because, doggone it, we're Americans. We don't have to live like that. Here's what I want you to get. God bless America. I grew up, my, you know, my, my father was a World War II vet, the two brothers that served in, in foreign wars. I grew up in a military town. I, I, you know, I stand for the flag, all that sort of stuff. But listen, as Christians, we really need to embrace this concept. Look at Philippians chapter 3, verse 20. It says this, our citizenship is not a dual citizenship. I added that, but it's important. Our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. Compare that. Let's go over to James chapter 4. James comes right before 1 Peter, so it's really easy to find. James chapter 4 is really pointed. James 4 verse 4 says this, You adulterous people. Now, that's a good religious word. We, we all know what adulterous is and adultery is and things like that. And, it, it, and let me just use another word that we use also for adultery. You bunch of cheaters. How do we cheat? You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world is hatred toward God? Anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. And then one last passage. And clearly we're supposed to reach out to the world and love the world like God loves the world. Yeah. But it's one thing to love the people of the world. It's one thing to love people and want them to know Jesus and want them to have a better life and want them to have eternal life. It's another thing to love the world. You know what I mean? And that's what that passage is talking about. That friendship is not, it's not saying don't have friends in the world. It, it's saying don't build your relationship around the world. 1 John Chapter 2, verses 15 to 17 says this. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For everything in the world, the cravings of sinful man, the lust of his eyes, and the boasting of what he has and does comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but the man who does the will of God lives forever. I was talking with a friend just yesterday about how much stuff we want do we want because somebody told us we want it? You know what I mean? It's effective advertising. We're convinced that we got to have it. Truth be told, we are much more like the world than we care to admit. We want what the world has. We want the stuff. We want the comforts. We want the pleasures. We want what the world has, except maybe with less cussing. You know what I mean? The, 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 the real distinction between us and our neighbors is we just don't cuss as much as they do. But we still, you know, want the nicer car, the nicer house, the extras. Not that those things in and of themselves are bad. Here's, here's what I want you to see. Imagine a spectrum. I think I've got from chair to chair. Let me know, Mike, if I get off camera here. Imagine on this end of the spectrum is Jesus. And, you know, as followers of Jesus, we're told to be like Jesus. We're not told to be more like Jesus. We're told to be like Jesus. So, so we should be kind of on this end of the spectrum. Now, on, on the other end of the spectrum is the world. Imagine the most worldly person out there. I don't know what that was about. <laughs> Imagine the most worldly person, whatever that might be, the person who is just totally into the world, uh, worldly uh, system, worldly stuff, sins without reckless abandon, whatever the case may be. So you've got that person here. On this spectrum between Jesus and the world, where are you? Are you closer to this or closer to that? My guess is, quite frankly, that most of us, if we're lucky, we're about here. A lot of us are probably further that way. 
Now, here's what's happened. Because of uh, the way our society has shifted, you know, if we were here, say, 75 years ago in America, we would be with the majority of Americans. There was kind of this balanced Christian worldview, and, and that's where people were. And so that's where we were. Well, now that the country and the culture has shifted way over here, and so we might, in fact, be here, but the culture is, is here too. And we don't realize that what's happened is we look at where, where culture has clearly drifted away from Jesus, so has his church, so have the Christians. And the reality is, the scripture here that we read in 1 Peter says that we are to live our lives as strangers here in memory. We're supposed to be different than the world. But the truth is, most of us just don't. Two general characteristics of holiness. The first one is we're to live differently. And here's the second one. We are to love intentionally. I want you to see this. Take your Bible, go to 1 Peter chapter 1. There's a great play on words here. We've talked about before the different words for love in the Greek language that, that's used in the New Testament. In particular, the two words we want to focus on right now are philos, that's brotherly love. You see it even translated as that in the text. Uh, the love of affection. We would call it likeness. You know, we, we like people, that, that kind of love. And adelphos, or adelph, uh, uh, adelphos, or adelphon, which is... God's unconditional love, the love we're called to have. Look at verse 22. Here's what it says. Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth, so that you have Philadelphia, sincere brotherly love for your brothers, agape one another, love one another deeply from the heart. There's a, a really interesting word here. The word translated deeply. <laughs> okay, I'm going to teach you a Greek word. It's a real simple word, but it's really cool. The word is, is pronounced something like this. Ectonos. Ectonos. Except here's the way you want to say it. Ectonos. Ek Got that out there in the lobby? The, the word is Ectonos. It's a very specific Greek word that was used to refer to runners in a race as they strain for the finish line. Now think of that. If you ever run in a race, does anybody ever, it, it, not me, I, that's why I lifted weights, so I would never have to run. But uh, you know, some people who run, you, you ever see those guys, they're running and they're running. What happens when they get to the finish line? They don't just, oh, okay, we're finished. They get to the finish line, what do they do? Oh, one more. One more little push at the end to get across that rope. And this is the, the concept that is here to, to love one another. Ectonos. Really going out of your way. See, it's far too easy for us to say, well, I love everybody. Because, you know, we're called to love. Of course, of course I love you. Uh, of course we love one another. The, the scripture commands this. Agape love, I, I found this definition of it, is this. It is the love of full intelligence and understanding coupled with corresponding purpose. Love is intentional, constantly seeking to express itself in ways that will benefit others and ultimately draw people to God and His kingdom. We've, we've talked about this before as we're talking about holiness, and that is holiness is something we are, not just something we do. We're declared holy. Here's what I want you to see about love. Love is something we do, not just something that we feel. Love is something we do, not just something that we feel. All right, so what? You might have noticed that the title of today's message was Come Together. And I just want to say, Shh. <laughs> sorry, Beatle fans. Uh, <laughs> here come old flat top. Anyway, uh, yes, I'll admit that probably influenced my title selection. But really what I want you to see in the so what application of this is this, and that is that this concept of holiness. I want you to get this. Here's the point of the whole message. So if you're still watching, watch at least for, for 15 more seconds. Ready? Here it is. Holiness is something that we do together. 
Holiness is, I want you to see, go to, go to 1 Peter chapter 1. I want you to see something. I want to review uh, three verses real quick. Verses 13, 17, and 22. Verse 13, therefore prepare your minds for action. Verse 17, since you call on the Father who judges each man. And verse 22, now that you, here's what I want you to know. All of those yous are plural. Since we need to together prepare our minds for action. Since we call on a Father. We are not only children of the Father. We call on a Father. Since we have purified ourselves, we do this together. We err when we think of holiness as some sort of spiritual isolationism. Even as believers, we think that personal holiness is primarily defined in terms of private behavior, prayer, devotion, personal habits, and so on. 1 Peter 1.15, Just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. Guess what? The you is plural. We are called together to be holy. If you've answered the call to follow Jesus, you're declared holy. And you're called to be holy with one another. We're to come together, as, the, as it says in the Proverbs, as iron sharpens iron, and develop together and encourage in one another holiness. And starting next week, we'll see very specifically what exactly that means, what kind of habits, what kind of behaviors, what kind of thoughts are involved with being holy. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, that, that you might be glorified in our message, what we hear, may we hear with our hearts and in our soul. Lord, I pray if there's anybody, anybody that, that is either in this room or watching us online that's never made a decision to follow Jesus, maybe today will be the day that they'll make that decision, that they'll understand that like the rest of us, we're all just sinners that need a Savior, and only Jesus is qualified to save us. Only Jesus is able to save us. And so, Lord, that, that we might know and love and be saved by Him, in whose name we pray. Amen.